be getting into my summer favorites right away for you guys. I haven't even filmed it yet for me, but I wanted to do a little book haul because this just came in the mail and I'm so excited about it. It's Ember in the Mist by Brennalyn Manti Manti Anor. Ooh, guys, me and names, not always the best. Um, but I'm so excited about this. This is a Christian fantasy story and I'm stoked. First of all, I love the cover. And I'll read a little, hmm, should we do the first paragraph? Let's try the first paragraph. Ever since her mother's disappearance, Naraya Rosewood has feared losing anyone she loves. Shiloh, her home, separates them from the ancient land of Betzeria. No one leaves or visits Shiloh without falling victim to the shadows in the darkness. Still, Naraya secretly wonders what freedom awaits her beyond the borders of her little haven. So, there is also some like extra goodies that came with this. I'm very excited, so the author sent this to me, and I love it because she is uh, a fellow Canadian. So let's see what else is in this little bag. This is so cool. So we've got a signed plate. That's cool. A little business card author teacher believer there's a little picture of her I gotta get let my cat out there's a cute little thank you we've got a bookmark ember in the mist okay which one of these do I show next because I love these okay well I said I love the cover so we've got the cover kind of like in a postcard type style and then we've got the map on the back that's brilliant you can stick this in your book while you're reading it and see the map. Why is this, like, I mean, it, maybe somebody else has done this, but I've never seen this before. That's brilliant. And then, this is possibly the cutest. Look at this. There's our main character. I have been, ever since I rearranged my office, I've been making a bit of a mood board, kind of like inspiration board on my wall. I need more masking tape, but this is gonna go up there for sure. So cool. So in the next while, I plan on reading this because uh, I feel like this is just fall vibes. Fantasy to me is fall and winter. So wanted to share that, then we will get onto my summer favorites. Okay, now we are gonna get into my summer favorites. So I'm calling this like my summer favorites video, but I've been doing, the way I see the year structured is in trimesters. So we go from January through to the end of April. I did a video sharing my favorites from that part of the year. Now we're going to be talking about my favorites from May till the end of August. And then in January, we will have another video with my favorites from the last part of the year. And then later in January, I'm going to do like a wrap up of my absolute favorites from the year. But during the summer months, I read some really good books. Like these are, some of these are definitely making it onto the list of absolute favorites from the year. So let's just dive in. I have two that I don't own physical copies of that I want to get done right off the bat because otherwise I'll forget. I have this categorized by genre. So we're going to start with like mystery. Um, I have classics, I have contemporary, I have historical fiction, I have nonfiction, and I have fantasy. So I feel like it kind of doesn't matter what genre you read. I almost have you covered here probably. So the first one we're going to start with is Vera Wong's Unsolicited Advice for Murderers. Now, I mean, just based off of that title, I was really hoping I was going to love it, and I did. So we follow Vera Wong. She has the, um, I think it's, she calls it Vera Wang's Famous Tea House, I think is what it's called. She named it Vera Wang um, to kind of to be funny and maybe get people curious, even though her name is Vera Wong. Um, she tried to steal Vera Wang's name really and so she's got this tea house she is fairly elderly I don't know if it actually says her age but she goes down to her tea house one morning and there's a dead body there and I just I loved her old lady mannerisms uh, it talked about how she would text her son and she's like constantly texting him about if he has a girlfriend or not and like oh you should like this person because they're really good with their family or different things like that. And so, of course, Vera cannot just leave this mystery of like, why is there a dead body in her tea house alone? She has to try to solve it. She meets some friends along the way. It was such a fun read. I'm hoping, kind of hoping it's a series because it was funny, but I'm also scared it'll be a series because I don't think, I don't know, I'm not sure if it can continue on to the same level that it was. 
but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Then the other one I'm putting into this mystery section is The Amazing Mrs. Polifax. So I have a bit of a theme. I like old ladies doing like mystery espionage stuff. So The Amazing Mrs. Polifax is actually book two in the series and around the age of 60 Mrs. Polifax goes to the doctor, is kind of mildly depressed. He asks her, is there something you've always wanted to do with your life? And she says, yes, join the CIA. And that's what she does. And in book two, we go along with her to Turkey as she's supposed to be a bit of a courier. Things don't quite go as planned, but she is a smart lady. She's not like, you know, like Inspector Gadget who kind of like fumbles along, but actually other people are really helping. Like Inspector Gadget has Penny helping him along. Um, she actually does really well Yes, she kind of has some help along the way, but it's not like she's bumbling. She's actually doing a really good job herself. And I just had so much fun with it. One of my favorite parts is this younger guy that she kind of ropes in uh, along with her. And there's one point where he's like yelling at her. He's like, I thought you were respectable. And he thought he was like making this respectable old friend. Um, no, but meanwhile, like they're dragging a dead body together. So it was a really fun book and I'm hoping the series continues to be just as good because I've been loving it. Next up we have an Agatha Christie. I'm so glad every time she ends up on one of the lists. Um, this one is Towards Zero. So this is one of her books where we do not follow one of her detectives. It's not a detective series. Um, and this one is one of Agatha Christie's personal favorites. On the back of these editions it has a list of her favorites and almost every single one of these is also my favorites. Like, yeah, all of them. I love them all. So that's always kind of a good indicator for me. In this one, we have a lot of different things going on. So I'm just going to read the back here a little bit because I feel like this sums it up a lot. It says, what is the connection among a failed suicide attempt, a wrongful accusation of theft against a schoolgirl, and the romantic life of a famous tennis player? To the casual observer, apparently nothing. But when a house party gathers at Gull's Point, the seaside home of an elderly widow, earlier events come to a dramatic head. So in this one, we have an ex-husband and wife who end up at this same place, um, kind of like for a holiday. So he, the ex, the husband, ex-husband, is with his current wife. And for some reason, they've decided to invite the previous wife along. Uh, so that's kind of awkward um, and yeah there's some suspicious things going on as there is with Agatha Christie's books. Um, I really enjoyed the atmosphere of this book and the fact that I didn't solve it which is just I like trying to solve it but I really love when I don't. Okay moving along we're just gonna so which order are we gonna go in? Let's go fantasy because I'm really in a fantasy mood and I only have one fantasy book on this list. Um, I haven't didn't read a whole lot of fantasy in the summer but now in the last couple weeks uh, starting in September here I have been but I loved this book. It is The Eternity Gate and this video is going up September 9th. This book comes out on the 12th so I got an advanced reader's copy um, and got to read it before it came out and you guys if you like fantasy I, I think you'll love this one. I had such a good time with it. This is gonna be a duology and so this in this book we follow a main character who she is a the handmaiden of the princess and kind of something happens in the kingdom and she needs to impersonate the princess and there's kind of like war amongst the different kingdoms uh, i'm feeling i'm not very good at describing fantasy because it's a genre that well, I have some favorites. I haven't read a ton of and I struggle with just knowing how to describe them, but I loved this one. It's got the um, kind of like medieval or like ancient fantasy vibes that I didn't know I loved so much. My only disappointment when I finished it is that like I have to wait a long time for book two because technically this one's not even out yet. And as much as that's sad, um, it's also a really good sign. I'm very excited that this one will be out soon and hopefully more people love it just as much as I did. Okay, let's do historical fiction. This is my like really only middle grade maybe other than on my classics pile. Um, the Lost Year. So we did this one for an audiobook um, I did with my kids and this one is triple dual timeline triple perspective. So we are set both during the 
Ukraine famine in the 30s and during the beginning of like lockdown and COVID, um, so in 2020. And our main character in 2020, his name is Matthew. He lives with his great grandmother and his mother. Um, and Gigi is quite elderly and he's uncovering her past about her time during the Ukrainian famine. And there are some secrets that he's unraveling. And then we follow a couple of cousins from the 30s, um, Helen, Mila, and Nadia. And yeah, it was so good. Um, the Matthew timeline starts out really funny and it really hooked my kids in. They loved that. And by the end, we were like all crying. So it's like the best of everything that is in a book. Um, we really, really enjoyed it. Highly recommend the audio. They have a cast of characters. So someone is different is reading each chapter. And it was so good. Next up, we have a book in letters, an epistolary novel. And this is Things We Didn't Say by Amy Lynn Green. I tabbed this book up as I was reading it. So we are set in 1944. And our main character is away at university. But she gets called kind of back home to go live in her small town because they want her to be a, um, they want her to like censor letters at a German POW camp. So because she is a linguist, um, she is going to be censoring the letters and then doing some translating work and stuff while she's there. And while I did not enjoy our main character right at the beginning, she was very like black and white and graded on me a bit. There's some good character growth. There's lots of things that happen here. The book starts out actually with a letter from the main character to her attorney saying that she is not guilty of the crimes that she's been, oh, the, she's not guilty of treason. Um, and so she has forwarded on a bunch of letters, this rest of this book, so in hopes that the lawyer will puzzle it together and everyone else will agree that she's not guilty. I really enjoyed it. It definitely gives me like a little bit of Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society vibes, but also like it's a completely different book. But if you like that one, I feel like you would probably enjoy this one as well. Next up is one that I just read in August and I enjoyed it so much. It is The Lake House by Kate Morton. So this has now become my favorite Kate Morton book. This one has slightly like detective and mystery vibes, which her books don't usually. So this one is set in mostly 1933 in Cornwall and a bit present day and then a little bit like kind of bouncing around around the 1933 timeline. But what happens in 1933 is this family is having like this annual summer party that they have and the um, their like 11 month, I think he is, 11 month old son goes missing that night and he's never found. And then in the present day timeline, our main character is in some trouble. She is a detective. She crossed some boundaries she wasn't supposed to and while she's chilling in Cornwall, trying to lay low a little bit, um, she comes across this mystery and really wants to solve it. And I have usually said that Kate Morton, her books are a little long for me, like 100 pages too long. And this one, I was just enjoying every page. And it made me excited to pick up her newest book. I'm hoping I enjoy that one just as much because I think that's the only other one I have to read. Unfortunately, her like Second newest one, The Clockmaker's Daughter, was my absolute least favorite of hers. So I'm hoping she goes more in this direction instead of the other direction. But this, this was really fun. Okay, let's go contemporary. I have two contemporary books. Um, the first one is Twice Sold Tales. This is another one of those books. Uh, yeah, I tapped it a lot. Um, like if you like books, which I'm assuming you do because you've made it like 15 minutes into this video. Um, I think you're gonna like this one. This is the kind of like the start of a series. There's also two novellas that take place before this. Um, but we follow, in here we follow a main character named Harper. She has inherited this bookshop from her great aunt and the bookshop is struggling a bit and she doesn't really know why. So she ends up getting help from a man named Milton who if you read the novellas that come before this, this is what he does is he helps businesses get out of trouble and like, you know, out of the red and into the black kind of thing. And 
As a bookish person, I just love the kind of hanging out in a bookstore all day. Harper, she's not the greatest with people. And all of Harper's chapters start with um, the title of, or like the words that are on the bookish shirt that she's wearing because she wears bookish shirts all the time like books because reality is overrated. And then we also meet a man named Noah who has just kind of like become a father to a seven-year-old son. Um, he didn't realize that he had a child and then all of a sudden he was the caregiver for this child. And so every one of his chapters starts with a parenting tip. And then when we get Milton into the book, then his chapters all start with book recommendations. And you guys, this book will kill your TBR, not only between like Milton's chapter suggestions, but then also throughout the book, there are quotes and it's like, oh, I've never read that book. Um, it's, it's really good. I enjoyed it. Shatona always takes things like I don't know, just deeper than I'm expecting them to go, and I really appreciate that. So, oh, and she just announced, I think the next book in the series is coming out next month. I didn't actually look at the date. I saw the cover in her newsletter, and I forgot to look at the date, but I'm definitely gonna be continuing the series. I'm just parched today, today. Oh, <laughs> can't even talk. Okay, moving along. Um, yeah, The Extraordinary Deaths of Mrs. Kip, a title that didn't make sense to me until it like got into the book. Oh man, Mrs. Kip. I want to be an old lady like her. She is so inspiring. So in this book, we follow Aiden. She is a journalist, a cub reporter. And she's kind of, I guess, testing the limits um, at the place that she works. And so her boss puts her on this assignment to write an obituary for this woman named Mrs. Kip. But it's actually, Mrs. Kip has led an incredible life and it's a bit of a test for Aiden and she has to go spend time with Mrs. Kip who is like, she's in hospice care. She doesn't have long to live, but she is the sweetest lady that just cares about other people and I just want to be like her like now in my life and when I'm older for sure. Um, so we kind of, eventually Aiden starts peeling back the layers of Mrs. Kip's life and the things that she did and yes i loved this story so much so many tears <gasps> so many tears but like in a good way okay i think it makes sense to do classics and then non-fiction so what katie did this one i think is technically like a middle grade classic because our main character is 12 at the beginning um i think i'm gonna get my almost 13 year old to read this soon and so katie is a bit annoying at the beginning, I'll be honest. She reminds me so much of myself at this age, like, oh, I was obnoxious. And I am so annoyed at myself now for that. But like, what do you do when you're 12 and you don't realize it? So at the beginning, Katie's very obnoxious and I definitely like related to her. There was a lot of similarities. Um, but then something happens kind of partway through the book, about halfway, so I don't want to say too much. But it changes her life. And this book has so much character growth. Um, even if you like, yeah, just look at the tabs. At the beginning, I have like three tabs in the first half and they're mostly like, oh yeah, she's annoying, but I can relate to this. And then in the second half, the tabs pick up because there's so much growth. And it's an easy read. This book was originally published in 1872 and it does not read like it. It's one of those books where it's like, if, if somebody had wrote this now, pretending to have written it back then, I would be like, oh, this thing and this thing, that's not, it feels more modern than 1872. Um, it was, it was just an easy read and I enjoyed that. Oh, okay. This book wrecked me. I had no idea what I was in for. I mean, everybody loves it, but I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know you guys, the outsiders. I still have not watched the movie. I don't know if I will ever watch the movie. Um, I'm just not a movie person, even, even if I hear good things, but I do have the movie edition. My dad actually, uh, I did a video with my daughter sharing her favorite books over on my homeschool channel. My dad watched it and he texted me. He's like, I've never read the book, but I've watched the movie. Um, which I could see he would like that. This is, this is totally up his alley. Okay, The Outsiders. I think the less you know going into this, the better. But I will say that the author, um, she started this as a teenager. I think she started writing it when she was 15, published it when she was 17. And this is one of the best books I've ever read. <laughs> But I didn't know much going into it and I don't want to say much. Uh, our main character is a boy named Ponyboy. 
I think he's 14. He kind of lives in a bit of a gang. His parents have died. His older brothers are kind of taking care of him. They're the greasers. They're like the poor people. And they um, kind of like their enemy gang is the socials, the socias. And oh man, this just wrecked me. I mean, I don't want to say anything else. It was amazing. So amazing. Okay, one more classic. This one is Daddy Lang Long Legs. Daddy Lang Legs. Um, this one is also told in letters with funny little illustrations as you go. Uh, we follow a girl named Judy, but actually her name is Jerusha, I think. Uh, but she decides to go by Judy. I don't really blame her. Um, she, at the beginning of the book, gets, what's the word, like kind of like sponsored. Um, a trustee of the orphanage that she has grown up in has offered to send her to college. The only catch is that she has to send him letters every month and she can never know who he is. And she, her letters are so funny. She'll be like, Daddy Long Legs, um, oh here. <laughs> Cause so she, she caught a glimpse of him as he was leaving the trustee office or the orphanage lady runner organizer's office and she was going in. And so she just saw that he had long legs. So she calls him Daddy Long Legs and addresses every letter to Daddy Long Legs. And she's just like, here, this is what I imagine you're like, but I need to know if you're bald. Like, will I draw hair or not? So she's funny, but there is, oh man, there's so much that happens in this book. I think my daughter, when she was reading it, she moved my tabs around. This is kind of bothering me. Little OCD here. Um, yeah, lots of tabs, lots of things I enjoyed. So fun. And then I did read the second book after this called Dear Enemy, also a good one. It didn't quite make my list of favorites, but I did really enjoy it as well. Another one that, this one was written I think 1912 and did not feel like it was written that long ago. Like it, it could have been written, you know, just a few years ago because it felt so relatable and it just, the words just flowed so easily. Okay, two nonfiction. I feel like I read a decent amount of nonfiction, but only two of them made the top here. We've got The Faithful Spy, which we have a whole book discussion about me and Tiffany talking about this in a live a couple weeks ago, but uh, this is the true story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the plot to kill Hitler in like this cool kind of like illustrated, some pages are kind of graphic novel-esque book, you guys. My theory is that every nonfiction event biography needs to be written this way because People will actually read it. I I loved it. Five stars. My kids are both going to have to read this as well. Okay, the last one is That Sounds Fun by Annie F. Downs. So I got this one from the library, then found it on Book Outlet and decided I needed to own it because this book just made me realize how I need to add more fun into my life. One of my goals for this year is to add more beauty into my life and also I think fun to go alongside that. The subtitle is The Joys of Being an Amateur, The Power of Falling in Love, and Why You Need a Hobby. And I think this is one that I'm just gonna like flip through on a regular basis and reread certain sections, kind of get inspired. I just really enjoyed it. Okay, so those are all my favorites from the last four months from May through to the end of August. And I can already tell you there's gonna be some good ones coming up for the end of the year, so that'll be fun. Let me know if you guys have some favorites from the last few months, some books that you think I need to check out based on these favorites. Thanks so much for being here.